Hey, everyone. Do you remember the day Steve Jobs died? I do. Because it happened on the 5th of October, and my birthday is on the 6th. So on the 5th, I was out celebrating with friends, and I didn't check my phone. But the day after, when I turned on my phone, I got a text from my brother saying, Steve Jobs died. But hey, it's your birthday. <laughs> Jobs' death was devastating, and not only to his friends and family, but to the entirety of humanity, because we all knew exactly that if he didn't make it, no one could have. Because he was at the pinnacle of humanity in terms of medical care, wealth, and access to technology. Yet, as we know now, Jobs refused potentially life-saving surgery for nine months. He leaned into what his biographer described as magical thinking. He believed that just as he had willed an entire company into existence, he could do the same with his health. And the contradiction between this scientific technology person and his desire to distort reality with magical thinking provides a profound analogy for humanity's faith in the sustainability of our current growth models. We have deep faith in growth and technological progress, and we have all the reasons to do so, because it is almost inconceivable how far we've come. Just think about it for a moment that almost 40,000 years ago, a person, much like you or me, left their handprint on the wall of a cave to send a message to the generations that followed. And since then, generation after generation, by standing on the shoulders of giants, we have reached the point in civilization where we operate our cities with electricity, we heal the diseases of our body, and more than 50 years ago, not only did we send a man to the moon, but we also returned him safely to Earth. And here we stand today. With the help of our devices, we are connected through a common consciousness we call the internet. And it is by sharing our knowledge globally that while it took almost 3,000 years to develop a vaccine for polio, we managed to develop one for COVID-19 in less than a year. Objectively speaking, in many aspects, life has never been better. In the past 200 years, extreme poverty has been decimated. It has gone from 80% of the world's population to less than 10% today. In the past little over 100 years, life expectancy has more than doubled, from 30 to 70 years and 80 years in the developed world. Literacy has increased from 15 to 85%. And despite our perception of increasing negativity in the world, especially regarding the current state of affairs, in recent history, there have been fewer wars, less crime, and less suffering. We are better nourished, more educated, and have more options for self-fulfillment than ever before. And while, inarguably, there is still much room for improvement in many of the areas I have mentioned, the level of material comfort and individual freedoms that we enjoy today would have been unthinkable even a couple of generations ago. Economist Waslav Smil estimates that an average person today uses up 34 gigajoules of energy a year. This, in terms of human labor, would mean 60 adults working for them, day and night. And this number is even higher for rich countries an American family of four today has more hired help than Louis XIV. The Sun King had at Versailles. And as a social scientist, I have researched the positive and the negative impacts of technology from the geopolitical consequences of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, economic downsides of artificial intelligence technologies, or societal polarization caused by new media, and all in all, I have to say that I am a technological optimist, because despite the bumps in the road, it is to a large extent the continuous development of technology that sets us humans apart from the rest of life on the planet. But with that being said, faith in technological progress should not become faith in technological salvation. Now, can I ask you, 
what was the picture that came into your mind when I talked about Steve Jobs? Something like this, right? Jobs, he had all the attributes of a prophet. He was ascetic, vegan, austere in his looks, and of course, a visionary. He could inspire people to do things they previously thought impossible. And the prophet, in that sense, is actually no other than a person in whom the essence of an era, the zeitgeist of a generation is embodied. And the zeitgeist of our generation is technological optimism. Popular culture has picked up on this. New York Magazine featured jobs with the headline, I God. The Economist ran a cover of Jobs with a tablet and a halo entitled The Book of Jobs. And although there is a uh, running joke that states that Apple is not a religion because no faith was ever needed to understand the superiority of the Mac, uh, the cult around technological optimism is no, by no means a joke. Have you ever thought of the symbolism behind the bitten apple? It represents the promise of technology to relieve us from the struggles of human existence. It promises to lift the curse, the curse of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, and provide a godlike effortlessness to our lives. And although Jobs is no longer with us, the hype surrounding technological entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeffrey Bezos, or of course the real Iron Man, Elon Musk, is nothing short of a cult built on technological optimism. Technological optimism is the belief that science and technology will be able to solve all of our major social and environmental challenges without having to fundamentally rethink our growth models. It states that problems created by economic growth can be solved by more economic growth. And the academic foundation of this thought comes from, comes from economist Simon Kuznets, the father of the GDP. According to the so-called EKC hypothesis, or environmental Kuznets curve, despite initial increases in environmental degradation, after a certain level of income has been reached, environmental pressure will eventually subside. Simply put, we can decrease environmental impact while growing the economy. We only need to learn how to produce and consume more efficiently and with the application of green technologies and expected technological breakthroughs. Easy, right? And now we have a techno fix for everything. Water shortages. Let's build desalination plants. Food security. Fix it with genetically modified crops. Bees dying. Replace them with tiny drones. Climate change. Let's try geoengineering. But what if none of this works? Well, luckily, SpaceX can still take us to Mars, right? But have we gone too far? In our quest of becoming superhuman with the help of technology, have we forgotten our basic biophysical realities of being just ordinary creatures of nature? And now I think I am at the point where I need to state some unpopular facts, so bear with me. Our current green technologies are not entirely green. We have major challenges with the material usage and the recycling of wind turbines and solar panels. And storing energy is still inefficient and relies heavily on the use of critical raw materials. Those increasing efficiencies in production that I've talked about, paired with expanding consumption, still lead to more pollution. An effect economists call the Javans paradox. And environmental degradation comes not only in the form of climate change, but also in material usage and the changing of the biologically active surface of the planet. The mass of human-made materials, from buildings and plastic bottles to clothes, has surpassed the mass of all living things on the planet. According to the Global Footprint Network, the global economy currently exceeds the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet by 75%. Very simply put, that means that we use up 
1.75 Earths each year. And while the universalization of affluence is commonly understood as a logical path of progress, economist Samuel Alexander estimates that in about 50 years, accounting for population growth and increasing living standards, the global economy would need to be around 80 times larger in terms of GDP than the developed world's aggregate today. This is absurd. So how is it possible that our gold standard for measuring political and economic success is still considered to be an average of 2 to 3% GDP growth per year. And by the way, that means a doubling of the size of the economy every 23 years. Does anyone know why the GDP was invented? It was developed in the 1930s to measure the recovery from the Great Depression in terms of economic output. And some say that since then it has become the single most powerful statistical figure in human history, but it was precisely its invent inventor, Kuznets, whom I mentioned earlier, who had warned that the GDP was a measure of economic activity and not of economic or social well-being, as we commonly understand today. So what can we do about it? Well, first, we need to understand that while material innovations are indeed crucial to progress, currently we are falling behind in a cultural sense. Because regardless of material innovations, as long as we maintain consumption at the heart of our growth models, we will continue to see environmental degradation. And more so from the human side, we will continue to see stress, time poverty, alienation from nature, mental illness, and a growing sense of meaninglessness. And there is no technological fix to that, precisely because this is not a technological problem, but a cultural and spiritual one. And you know, when I ask my students at university about how they see the state of the world today, they are extremely pessimistic. And that is because they are in the beginning of their 20s and all they have ever experienced in their adult life was crisis after crisis. Health, economic, financial, security, environmental. And while that is heartbreaking, there might still be a silver lining to it. Because in a way, it is good that now each of us are worried about the world's problems as if they were our own. It is good that we care. But there is an optimal amount of pessimism that does not become fatalism. Because we also need the conviction that we can do something about it. Because we do have a long-standing tradition from the Greek-Roman Stoics to Buddhism, Christianity, and even recent economic movements that focus on a steady state or a degrowth economy that promote a perhaps more austere but simpler life. A life that focuses on human well-being rather than economic output measured in GDP. And to map out the details of such a growth paradigm is perhaps our biggest challenge yet. But there is a sense of awakening and initiatives around the area of a new sustainable economics. The revolution of sustainability if there will be one, will be one of cultural and spiritual and not merely technological nature. So let us abandon magical thinking based on technological optimism and start looking within at what a growth model that focuses on human well-being and the biophysical realities of our planet could look like. And finally, I am going to finish with a quote as well, but not from His Holiness the Pope, but from Tellerede, Edward Teller, Hungarian-American theoretical physicist, the father of the hydrogen bomb, although Teller himself considered that title to be of rather poor taste. So Teller writes, and I quote, a pessimist is someone who is always right, but takes no joy in it. An optimist is someone who believes that the future is uncertain. I claim that it is a duty to be an optimist. 
Because if we believe that the future is uncertain, then our responsibility is even greater to do what we see as best in the face of uncertainty, so that the future we create will be better. Thank you.